Okay, yes. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Sorry for the uh, delay on the old chair thing, but it's kind of their fault. Let's just be honest. <laughs> just kidding. But we don't want to be so far away from you, so this is as close as we can get to you. Um, welcome tonight. You should have taken a shower, man. I mean, yeah, that's, that's the problem. Um, welcome tonight. If this is your first time, I'm glad you, you joined us. Many of you have come here before. And uh, for those of you who are new, um, we are, we, we, uh, the six of us up here on stage, pastors here at the church, we want to be able to, uh, we're on the floor, we're on stage, haha. Um, we want to be able to talk about things together. And so tonight um, we are specifically talking about a discussion we've had all, all summer. It's kind of the focus we've had all summer, specifically on biblical leadership. And over the last couple of Gathering Wednesdays, last month and this month, we want to specifically hone in on um, the uh, leadership in the church pertaining to elders or overseers or pastors. Bishops. And so, <laughs> pastor. um, and so we've been preaching on this topic um, really all summer. We did a, a preaching series on these things. We preached on uh, what a, a biblical pastor is. We preached on what deacons are. We preached on uh, the congregation, church members. Um, we've also been going through the book of Titus all summer, and that has come up in that book. And so it's just something all summer we've been talking about. <clears throat> and so we felt it necessary to, to talk about these things on a gathering Wednesday. And tonight we want to specifically talk and finish up the conversation we had last month because we were not able to finish that up. And so um, if you weren't here last month, we're going to do here in just a moment, we're going to kind of give you a brief, brief rundown of what that was we talked about. But what we're wanting to talk about specifically tonight is a move away from leadership that um, we would call maybe like a CEO style model of church leadership to what we believe is more of a biblical model of church leadership, specifically the plurality of, of pastors, all with equal authority, equal qualifications, uh, accountability, all that kind of stuff. And so there was a lot to talk about last month. We ran out of time because you got six people who preach a lot and teach a lot, and we love doing that. And then we didn't have time for questions at the end. And so we had many of you come up and ask some questions, and through that last month, ask some questions. Um, and we, wanted, we thought, you know, let's just <clears throat> have time, at least 30 minutes or so this evening, that we could allow some discussion. So if you uh, have questions tonight, we want to make sure that you get some of those uh, answered if, if possible. Okay? So that's what it's going to look like tonight. Jonathan's going to be our <clears throat> MC to help us because we ran out of time last time. He's going to watch the clock and kind of keep us on target, right? Mm -hmm. That's the goal. Yep. Is your microphone working? Yeah. Okay, oh, there we go. hello. Hello. So that's the plan for tonight. We have a few things we want to talk about from the front end, and then we are going to open it up. I think Drew is here as well, and so he has a microphone, and, and so later on we'll be able to uh, have some questions from you guys concerning <clears throat> this topic. And so we would ask, just so everybody hears, I know sometimes when, um, we'll see how fast Drew is, but if somebody over here is asking a question and somebody else will call over here and you start talking, and you're like, I don't, I don't need a microphone, I can talk loud enough. Well, the problem is we have people who can't hear. So it's not necessarily your voice, it's that some people can't hear, like David, who's deaf in one ear. Okay, so for the sake of everybody being able to hear, just wait for that microphone, we'll let Drew get over there uh, to you and make sure we can hear the kind of discussion. All right, so we won't have a conversation tonight. All right, deal? Cool. Let's pray and we'll, uh, we'll jump right into our time together. <clears throat> Father, we're, we're thankful for um, all your blessings to us. Uh, the, the meal we had and the provisions that you, you give us, we're, we're thankful. We know all those things uh, come from you. And one of those gifts, Lord, we have is, is the church. It's one of the greatest gifts you gave uh, to us, to the believer, because we, we have fellowship with one another. We serve one another, and it is this evangelistic tool that the world can look at, should look at, and see the way we love one another, see the way we operate, and, and they should see the gospel. And so, Lord, forgive us when we fall short in that, but, Lord, we want to be more biblical. We want to see the world come to Christ. We want to be a beacon on a hill. We want to be a, a biblical church. And so, Lord, help us. We need your wisdom in, in this. And so as we discuss these things, Lord, they are important things, and I pray, God, you just Help us to remain humble. Help us to be uh, learners and help us to discuss as a family together these kind of things, Lord, because ultimately we all want the same thing, and that is your glory and your kingdom to be um, just go throughout this, this world. So we pray for your presence here among us tonight as we discuss these important things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hello. So um, some of you um, were probably overachievers in school and grabbed the piece of paper on the way in. Um, we ask that you hold off on looking at it till the end. 
I see that some of you have already taken a gander. So we ask that you fold it hot dog style and put it next to you, and we'll approach that later. And if you didn't grab it, then you probably weren't an overachiever, and we'll get that later. It's on the back table. Okay. So let's start with everything that went down last month. So we're going to go one by one and two to three sentences, give kind of an overview, brief, of what uh, you talked about. David was on sabbatical, so he will not talk upon uh, last month, but he will chime in on some of the questions later. So uh, let's start down there with Mr. Matthias Rosebrook as we work on our microphone passing. Go. Yeah, so last month, uh, what I talked about specifically was the importance of having this conversation in the church. Um, we find it important because uh, what the Bible speaks on, we want, to, we want to be very clear on. If the Bible says something about a topic, we want to talk about the topic. We want to know and understand as best we possibly can what the Bible says about the topic. And so we talk about the importance of it, uh, the importance of understanding as a church the qualifications uh, of the character of the pastor. So, Nate Jones? I wrote. Maya? <laughs> Matt got doing that. Go, on, man. go ahead, Nate. All right. Uh, I wrote my sentences down because the rules were two or three sentences. So I wrote my sentences down. So, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was oh, already, okay sorry here we go uh, at our last gathering Wednesday I want to show that this idea this idea of plurality leadership in the church is not a new method or a new strategy it's also not Presbyterian or Mormon rather the plurality of pastors is the very Baptist I believe I used the word Baptistic last time very Baptist. In fact, it was the norm in Baptist history and the norm in the Southern Baptist Convention in particular. In fact, our Baptist Faith and Message, 1925, 1963, and 2001 editions all use the plural form of pastors leading the churches. So that's what I discussed the history of elders last time. Connor Scholes. So I talked about what it means when we talk about biblical leadership, uh, that Jesus is the head of the body. He is the head of the church, um, that in the, the elder pastor bishop position are biblically qualified men who are set apart and that we also have deacons who are qualified servants and church members. And because of that, we wanted to make it very clear that uh, as we look at what it means to be um, a church that has a pastor, pastoral team structure, that that would be a pastor led but congregationally governed um, Situation, which is the way that it actually is right now. Matt Brown. So my job was to talk about the main job responsibilities of the pastor, and I kind of uh, got them into three different things. The first one is that pastors are to attend to the spiritual needs of the congregation by preaching and teaching the word of God. You see that in Titus 1.9. Pastors are to be prayerful in everything that they do. You see that in Acts chapter 6, verse 4. And pastors are to care for and shepherd the church that the Lord has given us, not from a domineering manner, but with all humility. See that in 1 Peter 5, 1. Very good. Wes Wakefield. Yeah. I talked on the practicality of what pastors do and why that's important. So the practical things were it balances pastors' weaknesses. Uh, we all have strengths. We all have abilities. We all, uh, sometimes we're expected to have everything, you know, that everyone's looking for, but we don't. And so we talked about what that looks like where we where others are great at teaching or shepherding or counseling, we just uh, really offset each other really well. And so that, that was important. Second thing we kind of looked at was diffuses congregational criticism, where you're just not going after one person. If you, something's wrong, you don't like the color of the carpet, or you don't like how this has happened or that's happened. You just don't attack one person. It's a, it's a team coming together. So it kind of protects that whole diffusing congregational uh, criticism into one guy. Uh, it adds pastoral wisdom. Uh, we talked about on the council of many, there's wisdom. And so uh, when we collaborate together, we pray together, we kind of bounce things off each other. And so that allows us to speak into each other and help each other to further the work of his church and his kingdom. And it also enables corrective discipline uh, when it comes to church discipline, for the Lord loves those uh, that he disciplines. And so uh, it's just not one person. It's, a, again, us coming together and talking through this and, and seeking wisdom and how to handle those difficult times uh, when we have to do it. That's amongst ourselves. That could be with one person, it could be a large group, whatever that looks like, how we walk through that together. And it diffuses us versus him type of mentality. So um, when one person just doesn't take the whole load upon themselves, that we can share the load and uh, be there for each other. So we just talk about practical ways. 
Okay, very good. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, so this next portion, we have, we're have we going to take about 17 minutes. If it doesn't take that long, we'll go ahead and scoot to questions. But um, any of you can chime in at any point. So uh, work on sharing the microphone, right, right, left. You guys, two, two, and two. Um, does every pastor or elder, same word, need to be paid? You told me Executive to Pastor first. David Fortner. Okay. Um, short answer is no. In fact, if you look at the scriptures, um, when the Lord is saving individuals in a town, a village, or a city, he will gather them together. At first, you do not have any, quote, vocational elders or paid elders. As that church is growing and maturing, the Lord raises up uh, a plurality of pastors. And then just as the instruction is given in 1 Timothy chapter 5, it says this, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and in teaching. For the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. So there, very much the expectation is, is that God is raising up leaders, these pastors, these elders in a church. And as the church sees through the guidance of the Holy Spirit that, wow, we are blessed. We have this individual and this individual and this individual. And they love the Lord. They love the word. They love teaching and preaching and they're pouring themselves into it. Let's us as a congregation come together and we're going to provide financially for that individual so that he can spend his full time doing that, okay? Does a pastor have to have a salary? No. If you even look at the example of the Apostle Paul, most of his time as a missionary and serving as an elder in churches, what was he doing at that time? Yeah, he was tent making. He was, he was working an outside job as he was leading these churches inside um, um, uh, throughout as an elder, okay? And so it's not the standard. We kind of get this backwards, I would say, in modern church life of, well, obviously they have to be paid because that's the professional that we hired to lead our church, okay? But if you study the scriptures, that is not how it is, okay? I'll give you a for instance. I came from a Southern Baptist church here in, uh, out in Lee Summit where they had, uh, they had church staff, so they would have a like a financial secretary, and they would have a, even a children's director that was on salary, but then they had seven elders. Only one of them did the church actually pay a wage to, okay? And so the other six elders uh, met with this individual. They met together as pastors with the same authority, with, with, with the same ability to preach and to teach, um, but at that time when I was there, they could only really budget-wise pay one individual. And that has changed since then. But again, I know this sounds maybe new to a lot of you, but it is something that is very biblical and has been around for quite a long time. Anybody else? Do you want to keep going, Dave? Uh, I, I can keep going. Okay. Um, uh, I'll ask you, Dave. Is that something we would ever entertain here at our church? Yes, I would think that would be a wonderful thing and a biblical thing that we should entertain that as individuals are raised up in the church. And, and oftentimes uh, we find this maybe with younger guys, but, but guys who have been in church for quite a while and they're confused because they love the word of God and they love teaching and they love to teach Sunday school and they would even love to preach. But then they also feel pulled to have a vocation, an outside vocation, and they're confused. And I think they're confused because the term lay elder, that, that phrase has never really been taught very well in the modern church. And so these, these guys are, are like, well, I, 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 can't, I can't be an elder of a church. That means I'd have to quit my job and, and, and do this full time and my church can't afford that. There's confusion when it comes to that. So it's not that you just have to be an employee of a church to be an elder. It, there are things as lay elders. There's also a wonderful benefit to that, okay? Uh, the benefit of the church I used to serve in, when you have seven elders, only one of them um, uh, being a vocational elder, the rest being a lay elder, there is built-in accountability when it comes to conversations like budgets and salaries 
and benefits because you can have elders that are really financially not affected when they pray through and they make decisions when it comes to financial matters. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Very much like, um, and it is interesting, because in the Baptist world we've kind of, um, we've, we've brought that lay uh, leadership accountability. Baptists tend to do it through committees rather than maybe the more biblical method of doing it through lay eldership. Okay. Not saying that committees are wrong, but that's kind of where in the Baptist world they've kind of moved in that direction with lay leadership. Okay, question number two in this team model. Um, who has the final say in matters of conflict or church discipline? It says at the top, everyone can answer. I do have the spinner on my phone. That, no, don't. Yeah, so I think in matters of conflict or church discipline, it, it depends on, there's a lot of things that go on in the church, whether it's conflict or discipline. And I think it matters, uh, there's, you know, are we talking about internal conflict? And I'll say internal conflict, we'll say like pastoral conflict or something's going on right here. Or external conflicts, there's, there's an issue going on in church that we need to speak to, that we need to resolve, that we need to remedy. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's, there's a difference. We have to differentiate between those two things, right? So if we have an internal conflict, how are we going to handle that? Well, hopefully we're going to pray a lot about the conflict. We're going to talk a lot through the conflict of what the conflict is. Uh, what is the issue at hand? Is the issue at hand a theological matter? Is the issue at hand a practical matter? Uh, what is the issue actually at hand? Let's talk through that and talk through that well. Um, if it's a matter of church discipline, conflict and church discipline, um, and things like that, uh, you know, the, honestly, the final say in a lot of the, in a lot of those matters comes from you, the church, uh, according to our current policies and procedures, and also biblically, that final say in matters of church discipline comes from the church. Um, yeah, and so you know, in a lot of ways, it's a matter of defining what that church conflict or what that conflict is and who has the final say in what's going on there. So a lot of it's going to come, the, the, the resolution is going to come through a whole lot of prayer, a whole lot of conversation, a whole lot of gaining wisdom, insight, and things of that nature. I think, a, I think another thing in that is that depending on the situation is, is probably within the staff, who's going to take the lead on that? I mean, you know, we lean on each other in different areas of expertise. And so depending on where that conflict or that, that discipline, that problem is arising is, is really which member of the staff is, is going to be the one that probably um, kind of takes that head on and, and also has the support of the other staff. And I think what Matthias said about communication, that's a huge deal. Um, being able to continue to communicate well through conflict is really the conflict killer. Because when, when we communicate as one, that allows us to really kind of head off a lot of conflict or even in those discipline situations where um, we see repentance or we see, you know, that, that resolution happen um, both in a biblical way but also just in a more practical way. Now, Nate, you get the red microphone that Matt has. We're going to work on sharing, Matt. There we go. Just, you can leave them okay. all on if you okay. want. Thank you. Uh, how many of you just love your boss and you just would love to have an interaction talking about these things? No hands? A couple. Okay, some of you do. What happens when you have a problem or a conflict with the boss? You, you can't really, you don't know how to handle that. It's awkward. There's a chance if you go and if there's a problem with your top guy, you, you really, oftentimes, in churches specifically, you just... I'm not going to talk about that. There's danger in that. You can't go to that person. You don't feel like you can necessarily do that. Even though they would say you can, it's still this awkward, it's your boss. And so you, a lot of the problems, if there's conflict, don't get handled in that kind of model. Uh, I can speak from personal experience, okay? I know these guys can as well. With a plurality of elders with equal um, eldership, equal pastors, there is this accountability that we can easily go to one another and there's not this hierarchy of if I have an issue with Matt that I can't, uh, I can't go to him because we're 
we're in this together. Does that make sense? And so it, it, it's this built-in accountability where we can feel like we can go together with these. Uh, well, that's when it's internal conflict. Um, but also on the external conflict, if there's an issue out there, when you're the CEO, when you're the head pastor and you hear all of the conflict, you get all of it on you. And you have to deal with it. It's too much pressure for one man to do. And I've just seen it too much, too often. The benefit of plurality of elders is that we share those responsibilities. We have wisdom. Because a lot of times if you're one guy and there's conflict, somebody has a problem with you, you're human, you'll fire back. But if you have a plurality of eldership to talk, talk through it, you have wisdom, you, you calm each other down and say, let's handle this correctly. It's just there's a lot of safety in that uh, when it comes to any kind of conflict with a team as opposed to necessarily one person who uh, has that entire responsibility. Okay, good. What happens when you don't agree with one another concerning a theological or practical matter? This is within you guys. I think we've uh, already kind of talked about that a little bit. Of uh, first step is talk to each other, right? If Matthias or David or Nate or Connor or Wes have an issue with something that we do in family ministry, well, they come talk to me about it. VBS, camp, curriculum, whatever it is. Um, that is really, again, we, we talk to each other about it, talk a lot to each other about it. That's, again, what, what happens on Mondays a lot of times is that we're discussing things amongst each other, figuring things out, sharing opinions, because we all know that we're all on the same team. So we can share opinions that might contradict somebody else's, knowing that how we have each other's back or for each other. I, I would just say, again, it matters. It depends on what, that, what that, the nature of that conflict is again, or what the nature of that disagreement is again. Um, if we're looking, and, and we talked about this a few weeks back, uh, or a few months ago at a gathering Wednesday as well, when we were talking about preaching and, you know, what happens if a matter of conflict comes up and, and something, you know, Nate sees something one way and I see something another, how do you handle those things? Well, you, you handle those things by a whole lot of prayer again, and a whole lot of conversation. Like, let's try to figure out how to get on the same page in this. Where, where are you coming from here on this issue? Where are you coming at, uh, for on this issue and so there's just a lot of conversation a lot of study on those things and a lot of it as well uh, when it pertains to theological theological issues is whether or not those those differences of opinion are are these things what we call you've heard it said before are these things rib issues that we are disagreeing on right now or that we're having issues with right now or are these things uh, spine issues that we're disagreeing on uh, can is it possible for us to see this thing differently and still work together and move forward uh, as, a, as a pastoral team? And practically, it's the same. It's kind of the same thing. Are we, are we really disagreeing on uh, what Matt does, whether or not we're having bounce houses tonight? Like, is that really something that we're going dis to be disagreeing on or from a practical perspective? Or, or, or is this whether or not we want to do harvesters, so to speak? Um, those are very different levels of disagreement as well. Um, some of those areas, and uh, quite honestly, some of those areas, I may not have an opinion, and that's okay as well. You know, but if Matt, as from a family ministry perspective, feels very strongly on the issue, um, and I don't have an opinion, then I'm probably going to go with what, with what he, with what he thinks, what, with with his opinion on it. And I do think there is some benefit to conflict and disagreement because that means we're not having group think, right? We're not all being yes men where whatever David says, go, I'm just going to agree no matter what. It's good to have productive conflict and disagreement sometimes so that we can share different opinions. We have six different perspectives. That's a good thing. There's much, as we talked about, much wisdom within that. Just you can't let that disagreement then spill over to personal, anything like that. So as long as there's good productive conflict, with respect and all that, it's not a bad thing. And I'll, I'll answer the question that's probably going through some of your minds. You're like, all right, there's an even number of people. And so what happens when the vote is 3-3 in those type of conversations? One, if we're at a point that we don't have consensus and it's 3-3, we're not making a decision because that's obviously means there's deeper issues than that. Um, and I can, I can tell you, going back years as we've had those discussions and, and uh, when we have someone or multiple people that have reservations, that makes us consider that just out of respect. Like we have to consider why that is. But the, also it's good because you have some people that will move faster and some people that will move slower. And so it provides a good 
yo-yo effect, a rubber band effect to make sure that we're moving at a pace that is okay and that, you know, that we really feel like God is, is leading us in. And so that, that is one of the ways that you kind of counteract that is you come to consensus because you take the time uh, to fully explore. Yes, the, practically speaking. This, these are not things we're like, this is how we would do it. We, this is how we have done it. Everything we're talking about tonight, theological issues, conflict amongst us, conflict with other people. We've had these issues, and so we've done these things. Um, one specific instance, there was five guys who saw something one way, and there was one who didn't. Guess who it was? Me. But what was cool is that these guys said, well, Nate, let me hear you out. And what it really was is I didn't know the whole background of the story. I didn't know the whole thing. But once they filled me in, we spent some time, then I was like, oh, I see it your way, and then we moved forward. What was really cool is to watch these other guys say, hey, it's not like, well, we got majority, Nate, shut up. It was a, no, let's hear you out. And we didn't move until we all understood everything. So this is practically how it's worked out, and that's just one instance of many. That's good. Yeah. Okay, last one, then we'll get to some Q&A. What will change in church life? I try to do quotations, but I don't have much hands. With a move to a plurality of pastors, elders. And at this point, I think we want to put the screen. If Matt Roush, can we change the... Now, if you have your piece of paper or don't have one, they'll be up on the screen. Um, this right here, so you can share. So, what will change in church life with a move to plurality of pastors, elders? Yeah, we'll talk about this in just a second, but um, to be quite honest, to be quite honest with you, what you as a, um, what you as a church member will see on the day to day to day, we'll say Sundays and Wednesdays, what you as a church member will see um, on the day-to-day, -day, honestly, won't change at all. Uh, and some of you are like, oh. <laughs> some of you are like, okay, great. Um, but quite honestly, moving to this idea of plurality won't change hardly anything that you see on the Sunday-to-Sunday, -Sunday, Wednesday to Wednesday basis because, like has been said already, we're, we, we've been functioning in this manner really for the last several years, I wouldn't even say months, but really for the last several years, we've been functioning in this manner. Um, I would almost even say we've been functioning in a type of plurality since we've merged um, in, in, in so many ways. Even more so uh, since Pastor Francis retired uh, a year and a half ago, 18 months, or, 18 months or so ago, even more so in that manner. Uh, and we've had to learn a lot in that, in that time frame. Um, we've had to work a lot of things out uh, with much fear and trepidation, getting things wrong, getting things right. Um, so quite honestly, from what you see on the day-to-day, -day, there's not a lot that will, practically speaking, uh, change with a transition from a uh, lead pastor model to a plurality of pastors. There's not a lot that you, that you would see change. Uh, a lot of what would change, because there always is a type of change that exists, a lot of what would change uh, would be, um, honestly, things like what ha how we function internally, uh, what happens with policies and procedures, things of that nature. When, uh, when matters arise, where do we go and who do we speak to? Is it one person or is it a group of people? Uh, if you are familiar at all with our current policies and procedures, there is a whole lot of job requirement uh, in our policies and procedures for the lead pastor. That would, a lot of that language would transition to the pastoral team as a team as the whole instead of a singular person. So that's a lot of the places where you would see um, a lot of that, a lot of the change would be internally rather than externally. Um, so th you wanna talk about this a little bit, talk about the change there? So you can see up here on, on this graph, um, what I like the first is that Christ is the head of the church. Normally that graph, who's at the top there? Who do we usually put at the top? Senior pastor, CEO style, okay? So automatically you have Christ as head of the church. And I know that it, it's not just a little kitschy thing to do, it's real, okay? When you're on a plurality and you know that you all share the same authority and you, we all answer to our Lord and Savior, this is how you function as a team, okay? So you can see this there. I put um, the creative arts pastor there, uh, Mr. Connor Scholes, 
and you can see uh, the media director, Jonathan, over there, as he is kind of like a direct supervisor. Why does that level exist? Okay, there is a difference in the level there because Jonathan is church staff, right? Jonathan is not a pastor, or he, he's not an ordained elder, but he works and does ministry with us, but he's church staff, he's employed. Ministerial, don't even. So, um, so he's there and he has this direct supervision under Connor. What, is, what does that practically look like? They sit down on a regular basis on what does Sunday morning look like? Songs, music, prayer time, all of that stuff, okay? They lead out in that, all right? Um, you can see me up there uh, with Stacy, again, church staff, Katie, uh, church staff, and then you have the custodial crew there, so a practical level. You see family, uh, Pastor Matt with uh, children's directors there as well. Again, direct supervisor, children's director, okay? The, in our day and age, we might as well talk about this now. There's a movement in evangelical churches where we're going to have a children's pastor and it is a woman. You cannot back that up biblically, okay? So we're going to be very careful with our vocabulary. We're going to be very careful with titles. With this children's director as a church staff member, but technically, as you can see here, it is being led by a pastor that is Matt Brown. Okay, uh, it goes through their preaching pastor of Matthias Rosebrook and preaching pastor Nate Jones. They lead out in preaching. What is our church going to study in the Word of God on a week to week basis? They come together, they meet, they talk, they pray through, they lead us pastors through that preaching ministry. Okay, does that mean they get to overrule everything that we suggest? <laughs> no. Oftentimes, these guys have horrible ideas when it comes to sermons, okay? No, I'm just kidding. Um, and we get into some theological conversations, and that's good. That's, that's what we want to have. But these men, we love and we trust them, and they are gifted in this. They are gifted by the Lord in preaching. And we as pastors, you as a congregation, are going to support them in those areas, Okay. And then you can see there um, also missions pastor, and I messed up, uh, Wes, sorry, missions outreach pastor, Wes Wakefield. He leads out in missions when it comes to 3M, when it comes to uh, Southern Baptist missions and everything that we're involved in, he leads out in that area. Does that mean he has absolute final say in all missions categories? No, he leads out in that. He leads us in that. We discuss it. But ultimately, that's the area that he's going to be gifted in by the Lord and that he's going to lead out in. So this is what it looks like, okay? It, it's not a power struggle. It, it is not a shirking of duties. It's not because Matthias is afraid to be lead pastor. It's nothing like that. We take very seriously that our church wants to be what? Biblical, missional, and relational. That first one, if you read it in scriptures of a plurality of leadership, we need to move in that direction irregardless of what maybe evangelical tradition has been saying to us for the last 70, 80, or 90 years. Okay? Oh, I'm sorry. And then also you can see there in the circles in the fact that as just as important as, as Jesus is the head of the church, we have our pastor level there, we have church staff level, and not to be forgotten, obviously, we have church congregation, we have our group of deacons, um, you know this, for practical, financial, legal reasons, we have a board of trustees for our church, we still have our committees, all of those being filled by church members that have direct access to other church members and the committees and direct access to all of the pastors, not just one of the pastors. They have direct access to all of the pastors as they do that committee work, okay? So I know this may look a little different than anything you may have seen in a church flow chart before, but this is definitely the direction that we are wanting to go. Oh, he took the microphone. Okay, so this is a lot to take in. Um, at this point, unless I look here, we all good? Q&A time? Okay, we got about 22 minutes. Mr. Drew back there, please raise your hand, be patient. Um, we don't want to make him break a sweat. And we'll open the floor up. Not all at once. Cool.
Cool. Peace out. See you later. There's one. Thank you. This is this is for Wes. What is 3M? Yeah, great question. That is our um, 3M is our missions organization within our church, and so there's a team of seven people that meet on that on a regular basis, and. We have 17 to 18 local, 17 to 18 national, international mission organizations that we do in-house, okay? So the Southern Baptists, we send our money to missionaries like Annie Armstrong and others, and so that goes out of the doors. Our money through 3M stays here, and 3M is basically 3M's make disciples, mobilize the church, and make an impact in our community. So that's what the 3M stand for. So our idea is to get our people moving with our finances and our support our gifts our talents and to go and make a difference and so when we go we want our people not to have to worry about paying for missions on the, out of their own pocket it comes through the church and so that's anything above and beyond uh tithe it has a separate budget that's something we're looking at in the future what that would look like to incorporate that into a larger budget down the road but we're not there so so anything that's given to 3m uh, is designated strictly for missions for our people to go to be the hands and feet of jesus good question I know everyone would be disappointed if I didn't ask some questions, so I will. <laughs> um, if you all have been discussing this and working in this manner for two or three years or longer, and it kind of came to a head when uh, Francis left, why wasn't this brought to the congregation before that to see if we felt that we wanted one pastor or a group of pastors you know, it was kind of appears that it was decided among you all and then brought to us to say, get on board. That's a, that's a great question. Um, one of the things, uh, when Francis went on his last sabbatical, um, his stated goal on that sabbatical was actually to study elder leadership. That was actually what he went on when he went on a sabbatical. He actually went to churches and talked about that and, and even actually had a report to us on that. So this, I, I know that it may seem like, oh man, this is something that we've decided. That's, this is more of a, is, is a conversation that that's the way that a lot of decisions in a church happen. You, you have leadership that is really praying and seeking the Lord and making decisions and starting to think through that process. And then we communicate what those ideas and that vision and what that looks like and allow you to ask the questions which we appreciate and and want to continue to have that but um really you know for us we've been we have been actively learning growing and and thinking in this for several years even prior to francis retiring because he was preparing us in that and that was part of francis's gifting was that he was great at finding your gifts and really pushing you to work in those gifts. And because of that, he developed a team of leaders who uh, could carry on with that. Yeah, so uh, for every intensive purpose, the policies and procedures still read as a senior pastor model. And that is how we function. It, technically, his title is lead pastor. So it, it's not... Um, it's not officially changed, and that will come down the road. We'll talk about what that actually looks like. One of the very practical things is that when we merged in 2017, on a very practical level, we had to do a team model, okay? Because you, you had, at that time, you had, yeah, because Matt, you were here on full time, uh, seven, eight pastors at that time where you would have this campus to take care of and this campus to take care of. And we wanted to treat everybody as if they had value and had meaning. And didn't matter if you attended at Noland or attended at Plaza. You knew that you had pastors that were going to care for you and shepherd you. And very much so on a practical level, we had to do it this way. Yeah. But it's a good question. Thank you. Um, I think I can appreciate the fact that this isn't just some 
new shiny object that has come along like we see in education and business where there's a, a new way to do things and it's gonna work and it's gonna be wonderful. But it's something that has grown out of what we were, what you were actually doing and uh, it, it's kind of now a tried and true uh, model. And it didn't just come because it's, it's the new uh, slogan. Uh, I, you know, I'm old enough, I remember it was a million more in 54, 64 or something. And Baptists have always been pretty good at having programs and uh, slogans and that kind of thing. But the fact that um, you, we, were kind of forced into doing this because of changes in uh, structure of the congregations being a, a two campus and the uh, former lead pastor leaving, I think I can really appreciate that, that it's now kind of a, um, a tried and true thing that has uh, arisen out of scripture and not out of a, um, a secular movement. And, um, you know, it, it may seem like, well, this is brand new, but if we stop and think about it, um, you really have operated this way now for some time, um, and it works. We have one there, one there. Do we have a hand? Okay. So Jeff and I are fairly new here. We're, we've only been here about a year, and this might seem like a weird question, but my question is if a church member family, family would need a pastor for a funeral, wedding, da 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 how does that work? It's a great question as well, and something that has arisen several times over in the last, we'll just say year and a half. Um, I can say that in the last year and a half, I, I don't want to say how many funerals we've had because it's quite a few, but out of the quite a few funerals that we've had as a, as, as a, as a church, Plaza and Noland, I think I've only done three of those funerals. Uh, the reality is that what we have found as pastors is that church members uh, have a pastor that they naturally gravitate towards. Uh, families church families naturally gravitate to a, a specific pastor, which is a beautiful thing. Um, it really is a beautiful thing. Um, and so that what, what has ended up happening is that a lot of times what we have found is that if a church, uh, basically that church family, if there's a death in the family or a counseling issue in the family or a marriage in the family or anything like that, I mean, the list can go on on the needs that are there. Somebody's in the hospital even. Almost naturally, one of us, uh, one of the six, not just a single one, kind of naturally takes on the, the, the weight of that thing, which again has been a beautiful thing for us because one person has not had to bear, needed to bear, uh, the full weight, of, the full weight of, uh, of three or four funerals in a week, which might sound crazy, but has happened before uh, here at the gathering. The, the full weight of three or four funerals in a, in a week, plus preparing to preach that following Sunday kind of thing. And so it's been really nice to have that um, ability to um, kind of ha just distribute that, the weight of that. And so um, we've, we've been able to practice that. And I think that's been, that has been inc an incredible blessing to me uh, as a pastor. Practically, I, I kind of shoulder more of the pastoral care initially. Um, and one of the, the helps is that if there are funerals, if I'm if I'm preaching that funeral, then we've got you know guys that are preparing sermons and they're not trying to double prepare those, and so that's how some of that's happened. We have I would say all of us are do have done or are doing weddings this year or last, and so again, you know, the folks that you shepherd in your your ministries tend to gravitate to you, and so that's that's one of the ways that we do that. But when it comes to, to visiting and some of that, we will share it out. Like I was gone for the last couple weeks on vacation. So Wes covered some of the, the hospital visits and reached out when there were some things going on there, you know, or, or I might know someone personally is connected to Nate. And so I'll be like, hey, Nate, this is going on. 
But that's, a, again, a shared thing among all of us. And no matter whether you attend Noland or you attend Plaza or you've been here a year or you've been here 20 years, you, you can have uh, reach out to any and all that you would feel comfortable doing so. You don't have to do anything like that. Yeah, I think, too, a lot of times people think unless the lead pastor or senior pastor visits me in the hospital, it doesn't count. So, Connor, we appreciate you, but how come the other guy? He must not care about me. And what we really want to preach to the church is that if any pastor reaches out to you, that as, is as if the lead pastor did, because we're pastoring you. We don't, we don't have this hierarchy amongst us. And so, does that make sense? Because I, growing up, that's, you know, as a son of a pastor, I think that was the thing. Oh, the deacons came, they visited me, but you didn't, you know? And, and that's something that we can practically share. Yeah, and so, and the only, and bu just building off of that, I would say that you as a church, um, and because there's so many others in our church as well, obviously, but you as a church have been fantastic at that. Um, you have been incredibly, not just gracious, but you have been fantastic at reaching out to Wes or to Connor or to Nate. Uh, you've been just, it, it, you, you've done a great job at that. That's good. Oh, you don't have to walk very far. There you go. Well, the 25 years I've been here, I've seen lots of changes. But I've been here through the best changes. And as I have watched since, well, before Pastor Francis left, there was quite a team effort going on then. And I felt that I had a hard time trying to, to decide about a lead pastor position to replace Francis. I, I love the team effort. And a lot of it is relational, what you're involved in. And I feel like I knew every one of these gentlemen and would call on them in any situation, any of them, and they would be right there. And, uh, and I truly love the pluralistic leadership. Nate has to answer this one. <laughs> Good luck, Nate. <laughs> no, um, just an observation um, in the um, Hopefully, some encouragement. I uh, have a pastoral background, 35 years in ministry, retired now. And um, one of the things that I have noticed, especially in the preaching, is the how content-rich the sermons are. You guys have lots of time to really work and hone and pour yourself into the messages. And uh, for the last several years of my ministry as a single staff uh, pastor, I've had multiple staff members through the years. Um, when you are the person uh, supposed to be there at every hospital, doing every funeral, preparing Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, you don't have the luxury of really digging in as deep uh, and really presenting the truth like you'd want to. And so I want to encourage you with these words and let you know that I appreciate the what I see up here and shared leadership so that you can really pour yourself into uh, the teaching and the preaching, which has been a blessing to me in the last several months that we've been in attendance here. Yeah, and that's not lost on us too. I mean, today I was telling Matt, there was a word I was looking up in the Greek I spent 30 minutes just on this word, and it really didn't matter. But if I didn't have time, I wouldn't just skip on past it. But I was able to really, because everything else is covered. We, we share some responsibilities, and there, it is something that we are blessed with. I know so many pastors like my father. and you, That's my uncle Larry, by the way. Um, I know so many that are in that boat. One pet, Look, there's nothing wrong with that. There's not, that's not wrong. Like, they're doing it wrong. We just have the luxury. This church has the luxury of having multiple pastors. A church that loves us as we want to have pastors, and we want to... Uh, make them not be able to focus on them, not have to build tents. <laughs> we want them to be able to do these things. That's because of your giving and your generosity and, and your tithe and all that kind of stuff. So we recognize that, but we have the ability to do that. And, uh, and so that's, that's why we would say hey, we have the luxury. We have it. God has given it. Um, we have the right team. Um, why not kind of thing. So kind of about seven minutes left. Yeah, I would, I would just add up. to that a little bit as well is that this is not – 
I would also say that this is not, the plurality perspective does not just benefit the six men that you see here um, in front of you, the six pastors. Building off what Larry, you said, the plurality perspective also benefits our families in, in some huge ways. In that, um, I, um, I remember pastors, and you, maybe you were like this, we were like this at one point. I remember pastors um, feeling like they had to come home early so that they could get to personnel meeting uh, on Sunday afternoon. They felt like they had to come home early because there was a funeral that they needed to do. Um, in other words, their families suffered as they were in the pastorate. Um, I can say very honestly that, 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 these, that working with these men, and not just these men specifically, but I, I believe that it's the plurality perspective, the multiple pastors, same responsibility, um, same authority, same ability to speak into has greatly benefited each of our families, I would even say, because we have the ability to not be there and it's going to get taken care of. And that's of great benefit to Jonas, my son. Uh, that's of great benefit to Caroline, my daughter, uh, to know that, that, that for dad, they, they come first. That's a great benefit to Monica, my wife, um, who knows that she can say, no, you can't go to that meeting tonight. And she, I'm going to be like, yeah, you know, you're, you're right. David can take care of it or Matt can take care of it. Um, so I, I just want to, it's not just, it's not just us that benefits from this. It's also our family. Well, not, to add to that, not only that, we can keep each other accountable. But there's been many times where I've tried to come into work after a week gone in Gulf Shores for camp, and Matthias is like, bro, why are you here? Go home. Or just, we had a, a lock-in or something. Like, why are you here? Go be with your family. So it is a way we do hold each other accountable as well. And that is truly a blessing as a young guy, too, getting into ministry and learning all of these things, you know, for several years now of we hold each other accountable and stuff like that. I think we have five minutes left. One or two more questions. We have one hand, two hands, and then that'll be it. One and two. So we've been here less than a year. So I guess. Uh, first off, I, I appreciate the, the plurality and the scriptural basis and the teaching that you guys have done. And I think it's pretty clear in scripture. I don't have any struggle with that whatsoever. And I agree with everything that's being said in that regard. I guess where I always struggle is the Bible's clear on that, but then when you start getting down to that practical daily administration piece, how does that all connect together? Is there a biblical model for that that's got good, solid scriptural basis? And, you know, I apologize, Connor, I was on heavy drugs the week you preached, so I'm not sure I got everything. So maybe part of that was in there, but... Uh, Medical drugs. That's surgery, Medical yes. Drugs. Surgery, okay. drugs. Yeah. yeah. And I do appreciate the response. Of the, I mean, I got more contact from the pastors at this church than I've had from any church I've ever been in. And I appreciate that uh, greatly. You know, uh, even though Nate asked for a tip, it was <laughs> not really. So on some of those drugs, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, just it is, is on an there every, more on an everyday practical scripture? level? Yeah. Right. Yeah. On every, we always joke about this. On an everyday practical level, we are going to lead out in our strengths, okay? You do not want this wonderful elder right here. You do not want him in charge of numbers and budgets and things like that. <laughs> he's a great preacher, a great teacher, loves the Lord, loves you, but he's not allowed to do that stuff. <laughs> he's, he's not. Okay. I'm sorry, I am. I, I said you were an awesome teacher. Okay. So, but he, he's just not allowed to do that, okay. <laughs> um, and, and so I'll lead out in that, okay, when it comes to numbers and budget, those are very practical things for a church, right? So my office, I'll kind of lead out in that, right? Um, but you don't want me to sing or attempt to play a, an instrument and lead you in worship, okay? You kind of do, but... <laughs> We're going to have those men that are gifted in that to lead you in worship and to lead you to prayerfully do that, okay? And so we're gonna, on a pra literally, on a practical level, every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday that we are together, it naturally happens, okay? It naturally happens when we're in a room together when we're gonna talk about, hey, what is, it gonna, what is it gonna feel like on Gathering Sunday 
of preaching through Titus, and he'll speak, then he'll, or he'll speak if he's preaching. What, what is it going to look like? What are we going to sing? What is the feeling? What are we going to pray through? And Connor will, will, will speak, or Wes will speak, or, or something like that. It, it, it's actually a really cool thing. I wish you guys could like see it work in action, but on a very practical level, the Lord has blessed us, and this is, again, not only the biblical proof of plurality, but the practical proof of plurality is that God has gifted us where we need to be gifted to lead this church. And um, so so it's, it's a very real thing on an everyday basis, on a practical level. Okay, so after this, okay, 30 seconds. Whoever answers better be quick. Last, last month you guys talked about the difference between elders, pastors, and deacons. So that there was the teaching element to the pastor and then the caring for by the deacons. It sounds like you guys are still doing a lot of caring for. Is that going to continue with the hospital visits, counseling, that type of stuff? Or are the deacons going to get to do more than they already do? <laughs> yes. So uh, we actually just had the incredible blessing to uh, rewrite all of our pastoral job descriptions. Our personnel committee undertook that. And it is uh, while we, uh, pastoral care will always be in the job description of a pastor, always, uh, because that is something that we believe pastors do. They don't just preach and teach the word of God, but they care for, they shepherd the flock. Uh, part of shepherding is caring for on a regular basis. Um, our deacons do actively go on hospital visits and do counseling appointments and different things like this. Um, do they need to do that more? Yes. Will they be doing that more? Yes. But we will always be doing some type of pastoral care. Yes, and absolutely. So, okay. So good. I need to cut it off. It's eight o'clock. Uh, I'm sure you have some wet kids downstairs that are probably still playing in the water slides. Um, if you guys have any questions, here's the good news. Um, you can find them on our YouTube channel about knowing all of these gentlemen that are sitting up here with me. And also, they have offices, and those office doors are open, and they have email addresses. So their name at gatheringkc.com, you can get a hold of them with questions, okay? So we appreciate you. Who wants to pray? We'll do what, like what we're doing uh, Monday. Matt Brown's going to pray. And you can come ask us if you have any questions Please afterwards as well. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time. Thank you for your word, which leads us and guides us and gives us much wisdom. God, thank you for this church. Um, thank you that they... We are the kingdom in Blue Springs and in Independence, Missouri. God, we pray that we would grow in that. God, thank you for this discussion tonight. May you bless our weeks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Have a good night.